You have said there's a possibility of all-out war. Can you expand on that? Well, I said if there is an attack on Iran, there'll be an all-out war. But all I am trying as a diplomat, and I think every other diplomat, including my American counterpart, should be trying the same, is to avoid war. This is our job. And do you think that war is in the air? Do you smell war or do you smell a retreat from a military offensive? Well, I do not like to call it a retreat. Uh, I want to call it prudence, and I hope that prudence will prevail. Uh, accusations uh, will not be uh, conducive to a solution in our region. There is a war that has been going on for four and a half years in Yemen. But the UAE is actually pulling back. The UAE is sort of hedging, uh, but, but they are moving in the right direction. We hope that Saudis will also understand. Nobody wants a humiliating situation for anybody because that is not sustainable. Yeah. We want a situation where everybody feels that they have won. Now, I know, because you've been doing a lot of interviews, that you deny point blank that Iran was responsible either for the tankers in June, July, or for the Saudi oil fears. Are you just going to say it again, that you, you didn't do it despite the evidence? There's no evidence. And it would be a miracle to produce evidence because it didn't take place. Had we been behind this, it would have been disaster for Saudi Arabia, nothing that they could have repaired. The reason I'm taking this to Yemen is because it is Yemen. It is the Yemeni war. So we you think said, the Yemenis did it? They said they did they it. They said they did they it. Said but they very did few it. people believe it. Well, because very few people are not prepared to say that the, uh, that the most sophisticated American weaponry has been defeated by the Yemenis. You say you didn't do it, and you're not going to sit here and make a mea culpa and a confession to CNN or PBS. But I want you to react to some of the statements coming from Iran. One of your top commanders in response to all of this has made threats to the United States and to U.S. bases within range. Um, why would they be making threats if they're not engaged in this kind of offensive action, or you might call it defensive? Because the United States has threatened uh, to use force against Iran. Uh, this is a practice of the United States to say all military options are on the table. Secretary Pompeo was the first, which is absolutely incredible for a diplomat to make a, an accusation against Iran hours be after the uh, incident in, in Saudi Arabia. I've said it too. We said it in a note to the United States that if the United States starts a war, it will not be the one ending it. But we, don't, we won't start a war. I can promise you that our military will not start a war. But we, we are very clear that if we are attacked, we will defend ourselves, and there won't be a limited war. Another one of your commanders seemed to be taunting the U.S. a little bit, saying the U.S. has seen essentially nothing yet. We still have so many cards on the table. Again, these statements seem to suggest that if it's not your government, maybe the Revolutionary Guard or the more hardliners are, in fact, you know, quite happy to take on the U.S., Saudi, other facilities, tankers. That's their job. If the country is attacked, then they have to defend the country. And the threat is coming from the United States, so we have to respond to the threat. I don't know whether you've read the Sunday New York Times, but Not the front yet. page says, aborting attack on Iran shocked aides to Trump. So this was the one after you shot down the drone. Yeah. And as you know, President Trump said, we are cocked and loaded, ready to go. And then he announced that they'd pulled back. This apparently, according to the New York Times, has shocked American aides, much less other people. So I want to know how you read that. How does Iran read President Trump's red line and then failing to cross the red line? Little, little Obama-esque. I'm not comparing uh, American presidents to each other. But I believe that it's none of my business. But what happened was that I think President Trump had been misinformed that this drone was hit in international waters. We made it very clear through a note that we sent to the United States through the Swiss that first the drone had been shot uh, over our airspace, over our territorial waters, and that we would respond to any attack. And I think President, in spite of the advice that he might have received from 
a certain somebody that this would be a one-time operation, found out that this would be the beginning of something. Is a certain somebody beginning with B, is it a member of your famous B team? That seems to be the case. So now that that certain somebody, John Bolton, former National Security Advisor, is no longer there, do you feel that the B team has been defanged? Do you think that there's a, a new opportunity for diplomacy? Well, uh, I always uh, have to believe as a diplomat that there is a new opportunity for diplomacy. But, You've but been it, sanctioned yourself. Uh, well, uh, that's not important. I think what's important is uh, to stop terrorizing uh, the people of Iran through sanctions that are targeting the people of Iran, sanctions that are targeting food and medicine for the people of Iran. So if, if the United States were serious about its offers of diplomacy, it, they wouldn't have taken the measure that they took day before yesterday, putting our central bank uh, under new sanctions. Because as you know, our central bank has been under sanctions for over a year. But the United States feels that it's either sanctions or war. Well, uh, sanctions are war. Uh, because uh, in a war, usually military targets are chosen. In sanctions, civilians are the target. So it's war, it's more than war. But, but let me go and address uh, the United States uh, saying that they want negotiations. The redesignation of uh, our central bank has made it almost impossible for the United States to remove the central bank from the terror, from the list. That means that uh, not, not only this president, but even the next president are boxed in this scenario of perpetual hostility against Iran. So what is it to negotiate about if this president is incapable of undoing something that he did the day before yesterday? Foreign Minister, are you saying that there's a plan afoot to close the doors to negotiation by the US president? I think the only reason they would redesignate our central bank is to make it impossible or very difficult for this president or his successor to uh, remove their name from the list. The bar is very high now. And I think those who proposed this to President Trump wanted to close the door to negotiations, not during his presidency, but even after his presidency. Some are saying that actually a hardline element, like the one you're describing here in the United States, in Iran also wants to see doors to diplomacy closed. Yeah, there may be people, but uh, the leadership in Iran is more prudent than uh, to fall in their trap. So let's just sort of take that um, piece by piece. I just first want to ask you one thing about the, uh, about the president having said that they were going to respond militarily and then calling it off at the last moment. In public, alongside Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, he floated this notion back then that it wasn't an order from the government, that this was a commander who shot down the drone. He was trying to say that this was a stupid act. I'm not going to respond to it because I bet it wasn't the government's intention. Was it the government's intention to shoot down that drone? The government does not take a decision on a case-by-case -case basis because you don't have time to make a decision. You need to have a general order to the military person sitting uh, in front of a missile system or behind the missile system. Uh, depending on how you want to shoot it, through the computer or through the person, to call somebody and then they call somebody. But this is an it's American a, drone. A, this is a, in a maximum pressure. You think yeah, a commander has no, his own authority? A commander has his own authority to shoot down an invading vessel. Even if it's American? Even if it's American. Okay. Even if it's American. Because anybody who, who, who violates our airspace are subjected uh, to being uh, taken down. We sent uh, two or three warnings to that vessel, to that drone, and once it didn't heed the warnings, it was shot down. Back to the Saudi oil fields, are you surprised that such a important piece of infrastructure, such a massive piece of the global oil economic puzzle seem to have been left without any air defenses. I'm not surprised because I do not believe that military capability alone can prevent disaster. 
That is what we've been trying to tell the Saudis, that they cannot buy security by purchasing more and more weapons. It's a much easier road if they simply start talking to their neighbors, stop bombing the, the Yemenis out of existence. We believe we need to start working together for uh, peace, for confidence building, for de-escalation, for exchanges, and even for a non-aggression pact. Are you extending a new olive branch? The olive branch has always been on the table, but we're showing it again. We also hear from your commanders, military commanders, that they're shortly to begin naval exercises, joint exercises between Iran, Russia, and China in the North Arabian Sea, in that, in that very critical area, very close to the Straits of Hormuz and the Persian Gulf. Yes, that's not a hostile act against any country. It's the first time. It's the first time that we are conducting a joint military exercise, uh, but it is not uh, like building a coalition for war. It's simply engaging in a friendly action with two of our closest partners. And actually, additionally, it seems that you were prepared, according to what's been written in The New Yorker, quoting you, that you were prepared to offer some more detail about the existing Iran nuclear deal. For instance, the Iranian parliament would enshrine the idea of the Supreme Leader's fatwa against nuclear weapons, enshrine it in law, yeah. that you would agree to sign on to the additional protocol, which is the most intrusive inspections several years earlier than stated. Is that correct? Had you offered that? Yes, we did offer that, and that offer is still on the table, provided that the United States would also do what they're supposed to do in 2023 now, and that is to lift the sanctions through, through U.S. Congress. We are prepared. If President Trump is serious about permanent for permanent, permanent peaceful nuclear program in Iran, and permanent monitoring of Iranian nuclear facilities, as you said, through the most intrusive IAEA uh, inspection mechanism that exists, in return for what he has said he is prepared to do, and that is to go to Congress and have this ratified, which would mean Congress lifting the sanctions. Is there any chance that Presidents Rouhani and Trump could meet at this General Assembly? President Trump has, has been tweeting, he sent out another tweet saying, I have no plans, but you know nothing's ever off the table, but maybe, but maybe not. Are you saying that President Rouhani, in this heightened atmosphere of tension, would still be willing here at the General Assembly to meet with President Trump? Provided that President Trump is ready to do what's necessary. Analysts say, that what's going on now is Iran sending a message to the United States, take us seriously. I spoke to many analysts who believed that under this policy of maximum pressure, Iran would keep moving, making it more painful, showing that they had the ability to affect the global economy in order to be taken seriously. Are you being taken seriously, do you think? Uh, we are a serious country. We are an old country. And we will be taken seriously. And some hardliners in Iran describe President Trump more as a paper tiger, or in the words of one of your senior analysts there, he's not a lion, he's a rabbit. I wouldn't describe a foreign leader as something like that. And one final question, because it does go to the heart of maybe what's happening now. It seems from the outside that there's yet another realignment between so-called hardliners and moderates. Your government is known as, as a government of moderates who want to make deals that go to the security and the economic health of your country. Many people have been very upset about the self-immolation of the so-called blue lady, uh, the young girl who went to a football match and then was threatened with arrest and trial and conviction and sentencing. And she poured oil over herself, gasoline, and burnt herself to death. What can you say about the internal dynamic inside Iran right now? What do you say about that girl's um, death? It was, it was an agonizing disaster. And everybody, no matter their political per persuasion, is sorry about that. Everybody, including the court people, believed that uh, it was a misunderstanding, that she was told uh, or she understood something that was not the decision of the court. But there is going to be an investigation by the head of the judiciary. Uh, the president has ordered uh, the minister of uh, sports and youth to open uh, football stadiums to ladies, because ladies already participate in volleyball games as, as spectators. 
And today, uh, in, in the capital derby, it was announced that next time, ladies will be in. Into a soccer stadium for matches? Into a soccer stadium. That's progress. Hopefully her life is not in vain. Foreign Minister, thank you very much. Good to be with you.